Okay, so to sort of start jumping in, um, in case people don't know, um, Aisha Tendiwe Bell is a first generation Jamaican and ninth generation traceable Black American. Her parents met at City College, conceived in Tanzania and born in Manhattan. She was raised Bobosh Anti Rasta, spending her early childhood on Boboville in Bull Bay, Jamaica. Inspired by the fragmentation of our multiple identities, Bell's practice is committed to creating myth and ritual through sculpture, performance, video, sound, drawing, and installation. Um, Bell holds a BFA and, and an MS from Pratt and an MFA from Hunter College. Uh, Bell also received a NIFA in performance art slash multidisciplinary work and has had artist residencies slash fellowships at Skowhegan, Rush Corridor Gallery, Abrams Art Center, LMCC Swing Space, The Laundromat Project, Rick, and more, including here at the Wasay Project just this last December. Um, she has been a fellow at DVCAI on International Cultural Exchanges, Jamaica in 2012, Suriname in 2013, Antigua in 2014, Guadalupe in 2015-2017, um, the Museo de Arte Modernos Triennial 2014, Jamaica Biennial 2014 and 2017, the Brick Biennial 2016, and the Venice Biennial 2017, Mojeda, Rosa Parks Museum, CCC ADI, Columbia College, Space 111, well and Cora Gallery and Brush Arts, just a few spaces where Bell has exhibited her work. Um, recently, a 2017-18 LMCC Workspace Fellow. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and two children. Um, I am per that is a, a lot to cover there. Um, I am personally, <laughs> yes, I am personally very excited that this is the um, first of our featured artist talks because um, Aisha and I first talked back when she was a resident with her family in December of 2019 here at the Save Project. And the first time we met, we just launched into an hour and a half long interview with like no breaks in the middle. So um, as our very first live interview artist talk, I feel I'm, I'm very happy that I'm talking to Aisha because I know that all things being equal, we can talk for an hour straight. Um, so, I would like to start, Aisha, um, by returning to something that we talked about in that first conversation in December. So we started that conversation by talking about um, what keeps you continually interested in um, tracks. Um, you said that it was because they're broadly applicable, and I want to get to some of those broad applications throughout your practice. But I also want to step back for a little bit and start by asking you how you first became interested in traps. Um, in your statement for the show, um, you mentioned that your traps are modeled after deadfall traps um, that your mother used as a child to catch crabs. Um, can you say more about that? Um, so, my first iterations of traps were figurative. So uh, the idea, uh, my initial paintings of people were trapped within the context of the two dimensional frame. You know, the idea that uh, we are viewed, watched, mimicked entertainment, but not necessarily pushing out into the, to the third dimension or invading the space of the viewer to, to have some kind of control over what is where we are, what we do, our environment. Um, and then uh, I focused on that idea of being trapped. And that's where I got, the, I came to trap. That's, you know, I focused on that. And I started to make traps. Um, and I made nets, I made um, dug holes, different kinds of booby traps, boxes that fell from the ceilings that were heavy, um, made out of clay, made to look like cardboard. And from there, I started to make the, um, the booby traps. Mm -hmm. um, and I was interested in the booby traps, one, because the, the, the cardboard, big, beautiful traps, because I like the idea that uh, you could get out of them if you wanted to, right? And then I also made them beautiful. Now, they're used, they were used when my mom was young and possibly still specifically to catch crabs, which are not the most intelligent creatures. So they go in for the bait and the trap didn't have to be heavy for them to not be able to get out, right? Mm -hmm. With the 
my giant cardboard traps, um, you could get, get out, they're popped. They could trap you, but you can always get out. The reason you stay is because it's comfortable, you know? Um, mm -hmm. It feels safe, it's pretty, you know? So I, I decorate, I, and that becomes a metaphor for so many things in life that specifically deal with um, the boundaries of race, sex, and class. You know, you get to a place where you're okay, I'm okay, I don't need to fight, I don't need to cause any waves, mm -hmm. you know, I have this job, I don't want to get anyone upset because I don't want to mess with my ability to pay my rent on my tiny apartment mm -hmm. in my, it's not that bad of a neighborhood kind of mentality. So you get comfortable with um, what makes you safe. And so that is the trap, you know? So my traps are all met are metaphorical, it's a state of mind. Yeah, one of the things that you talk about on your website is that um, you focus, the quote is, I focus on awareness. Are we aware of ourselves? Are we aware of each other? Are we aware of this trap? Um, can you talk about how awareness plays into what you were just talking about? Because I could see one way in which it's like, oh, people know that they're in this trap, but they don't want to leave. But it's, it adds an interesting dimension where you're talking about people not, maybe not even being aware of being in the trap in the first place. I, I, I mean, I don't think any of us are fully aware of the extent of the traps that we live in, right? Um, or even willing to call our situations traps different situations you know um now this is my opinion so some people may be like no i know every single trap that i'm in and i'm trying to figure out ways to get out of it but the consequences of getting out of one leads to another thing you know so so it depends on the individual i can't speak for everyone i think um the more you think about what a trap is a trap can also be something pleasant right mm -hmm. um until it's not anymore like after you separated from a relationship that wasn't working out and then you can see all the things that was wrong in it when, when you were there but um but it's also you know the traps that of the american promise right the economic freedom that you thought you were going to get when you worked really hard to get here and then discovered that it's not that comfortable here anymore you know Mm -hmm. um so they're so or this is harder than i thought it would be you know the streets are not paid the gold and the people are not friendly you know depending on your individual experience and uh, and then ways that you cope you know i talk about multiple consciousness and code switching and 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 a lot of those things have been associated specifically with um people who immigrate here or have to change mm -hmm. languages but we do it all the time to cope with things that are present in the trap. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that um, as it relates to like your personal experience? So you, you were just talking about like the idea of, you know, code switching to fit in in sort of a broader context, but can you talk about that like in your personal experience? Um, I, I'm gonna say that I would not consider my relationship to code switching conscious until mm -hmm. my mid twenties. Um, I think I was making the work about being trapped before I even realized that I did code switching. Um, so what made you realize that you were? I was on the phone with one friend <laughs> and another friend walked in and mm. she was like, I have never heard you speak like that before. <laughs> and I was like, what? So there was a, the friend I was speaking to, mm. I'd known for a long time. We were from the same neighborhood um and it was just it was like hey what's up you know it was a real casual conversation where mm -hmm. i guess in other situations including this one i have my professional voice on i don't know yeah you know, and that idea of a professional voice versus your casual voice is an interesting one which i didn't actually think about until that moment yeah i mean this this is an interesting entry point to the work itself too i think um I, one of the things that we talk about in um, the interview that is in the summer show is about how, um, you know, if you don't know how to speak standardized English, you're not going to get the job. That there's this okay. sort of like necessity of needed to code switch. But um, so, so that to me feels like 
um, you know, a way to get out of one quote unquote trap. But it seems like you're also talking about that sort of relationship to language as a trap in and of itself. Can you sort of parse that out a little bit, how you see that like dual nature of that uh, tricky trap there emerging? Well, there's a lot of duality in my work because I don't mm -hmm. think anything is one thing ever. Um, so, but, um, so you have to be, that it goes into awareness. One, you have to be aware that there's a shift, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, that there's a shift from space to space. Like in order to socially climb, pull yourself up from your bootstraps, you have to know what's in the next level. Like imagine a video game, right? You have to know that there is a secret passage on the next level in Mario Brothers. I'm old, sorry. <laughs> you know, so you have to be aware of that, right? And yeah. so once you're aware that there is another, there's a, there's a secret code or whatever, um, you can learn it. You understand what I'm saying? Um, yeah. So I feel like the, the, the act of code switching is definitely a tool for bootstrapping and the navigating class, you know, for, for people who are oppressed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's also, uh, it's also, and that's in the, I guess the more, the most extreme would be coming here and learning the, la the, in the language, right? I mean, that's what we think about when we think about um, code switching. Is it code switching? I'm getting that mixed up, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, learning a whole other language. And then the next one is learning how to speak, I guess, a more proper English in your workplace, in your uh, in, 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 in an environment to uh, a more proper standardized, Americanized English, right? Mm. Um, learning how to cover up whatever accent you have so that you blend in. I mean, you know, pe pe I'm, another way as I've, I've met people who go to England and have English accents, you know, you, um, any of them are on this call. <laughs> but, um, so it's always, it's always interesting how people, are, and, and of course, there are some people who don't do that. But mm -hmm. even those people switch how they speak to their child versus how they speak to a partner versus how they speak to their parent. You know, some people, there it, it might not be as dramatic as say a change of language or a change of um, sentence structure and vocabulary. Um, yeah. It can be subtle in the tone, I think. Mm -hmm. But, but I'm, I'm going into the broad look of it. Yeah, yeah. So we've been talking about sort of this relationship to language really broadly, and I want to turn and like root this in the work a little bit. So um, one of the things that we also talked about in our initial interview back in December is that you have a spoken word background and that you um, actually like recently in the past several months slash years have recorded a trap song that is in the show actually. Um, so um, can you talk a little bit about how, um, yeah, how did, how, can you talk about the process of like how you, um, came to that in your practice in the first place? Like what led you to want to, um, make work with a music song? producer to make a track song? Yeah. All right. So my practice, I guess, is not, so first my practice is I'm a ceramicist, like mm. straight it up. That's the medium I work with. That is the hardest to work with because you just can't fire it anywhere, right? <laughs> um, yeah. And that's the thing that I can lose myself in. Um, but a very important part of my practice is if I am inspired to make something that relates to the context of my work, um, I'll find a way, right? Mm -hmm. So no, yes, I did spoken word, but my spoken word is not rap and uh, trap music, is, is different. <laughs> yeah. um, so basically what happened was I was out um, at a party, uh, Mokata was throwing during Miami Basel. And uh, after a certain time, I wanna say like 10 o'clock, everybody over the age of 35 left. I stayed, I'm over the age of 35. Um, and the trap music came on. I was like, what is this? 
So I started talking to someone else I knew there, and she had done um, an article on it, and we were talking about the history of TRAP. And so I did some research, he sent me the links. I did some research, and I was like very interested in how, how the metaphors of the TRAP mm -hmm. in hip hop. Um, now, trap music is very difficult to listen to for me um, because the context is it's a little rough, but the beats are amazing, but the contents are harsh. So the contents of my trap song aren't the same. They kind of talk about, um, and they're rough because, I mean, depending on your experience and also, I, I and, and what, what you feel is sellable, but also what is true to yourself, it's a complex kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. that's not what I was doing. So I used it as a medium to talk about getting out of the trap, you know, um, because trap music, the trap in trap music is the center of where you're doing business from, illegal business, but where you're doing business from, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's also like um, a woman's secret place, right? <laughs> um, so it has all of these like, or being trapped, we all, the, the word trap itself has so many different possibilities for meaning. And so I was interested in that one, which made me challenge myself to make a, a trap song and rap and form it, which it's very different from spoken word, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yes. What has that been like integrating that into your practice? Because you have a long history as a performance artist, but how, how have the performances changed how has it sort of like changed conceptually for you now that you're like working with music and like music as part of that it, performance no so i worked with music when i did spoken word mm -hmm. but performance art don't rehearse right I, I i write maybe um other than the trap song um and most of my performance does not involve me rapping like None, none of it other than that trap song yeah um i kind of do a loose rendition and even in the trap song because i because i did perform right and i did also dance i don't want to i want to that that edge is the idea of a hard rehearsal you know mm -hmm. so there's some looseness that looseness left in the performance for new things to happen you know, and so the trap song performance was the only one where I had memorized lyrics and performed it like that, you know? Yeah. Um, I want to, I'm, I'm gonna be mindful of the time. I wanna like pivot and talk about one of the pieces in particular that okay. is in the show before we open this up for everybody's questions. So um, one of the pieces in the show um, is, um, radiate um, and I'm going to share my screen so that everybody can see the piece that I am talking about in particular. Um, so hopefully people can see my screen right now. Radiate is the piece here on the right. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, this is a piece that I saw in progress while you were in Wasaic. Is that right? I am not sure. <laughs> okay. Well, regardless, can you sort of talk okay. about the development of that piece over time? Because at the very beginning of this interview, you talked about how the um, you were initially working with um, the figures in your work in, in a in a more strictly figurative way, and they weren't like emerging from um, the um, piece in a sense. So, can you talk about like what it has been like? How, how that piece in particular developed and then sort of how your relationship to like working on wood panels um, in general has emerged over the development of that piece? Um, so, okay, that's a lot. A lot <laughs> that is a lot, I'm this. sorry. <laughs> um, but so basically this new body, this, this, this very new body of work um, that I started late last year, um, kind of brings together all of my work in one kind of piece, right? Okay. So I'm interested in, um, so I do the mask, I do the traps, I do the performance, um, I do the sound. Um, and I've been interested in the last, in the work that I had made right before this, um, 
in the patterns of thumbprints, fingerprints, yeah. scarification. Um, and so I had initially done very simple, just the head with, with the patterns of the scars or whatever you want to see those marks as. Um, mm -hmm. And then I started to expand that into the, two, the two-dimensional component, which I like to always, I always like to have both a two-dimensional and three-dimensional component related. Um, and so with this body of work, I returned to a series of drawings. Um, I have a full one that I did. They're tiny frame pieces, still working with the same concept. Um, I'm going to shop, um, stop sharing my, stop sharing no, my screen can, so that everybody can see those pieces. I think like it's tiny. So I, I returned to this series um, of drawings, and they're tiny, there's, and they're like 200 of them, of um, drawings that I had been doing a long time ago, before I had children, um, mm -hmm. that I didn't do anything with. I just had been drawing them. Um, and the color palette has been consistent in my work, and the, um, the, 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 the metallics, uh, thinking about, I use the metallics to think about wealth, um, the marks in terms of fingerprints, scarifications, boundaries, the lines coming out, um, the constraints of two-dimensional two space and the ability to push into the third dimension. Third dimension. So I felt like this new body work, which is very new, which only happened after my health scare kind of showed up, this kind of consolidation of, um, of, of, of everything that I'm thinking about in one piece. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's, that's where that, and, and I was, and I, I've been expanding on that slowly. I mean, this, this quarantine kind of threw me off teaching your kids at home and teaching your students from home is kind of messes with your studio practice. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, that's what I've been, um, that's how, did I answer your question? Cause I can go off on tangents real easy. No, you absolutely answered my question. I just have one more before I open it up for Q&A. So you just mentioned that sort of um, your relationship to your practice has changed a lot in quarantine over the past several months. Um, and I was wondering about that, particularly in the context of being a performance artist. You know, we, we talked in the past about how sort of performance is a way for you to you know, enter into um, another consciousness. Um, and quarantine does not necessarily allow for frequent performance. So like, how has your relationship to your studio practice changed, given that you're not exactly able to engage in a large part of your practice in the same way as you might have been before? Um, well, the performance is probably the only thing that's not on the table yeah. right now. Um, but it could be with this internet action. I've seen other performance artists util utilizing this, um, this medium. Mm -hmm. My, um, my um, relationship to performance is, I don't, if someone asked me why do you perform, I'd say I think it's because I have to because I definitely don't want to, right? Like mm. the, the degree of nerves that I experienced prior to, from when I did spoken word to second to last, um, when I have danced in performances, when I did dance, I wasn't very yeah. serious. I love dancing, but I wasn't very serious about rehearsals. Mm -hmm. um, to, uh, to performance, I would say that, that the degree of nerves is, is mind blowing, but um, the, for, for, in my performance art, there becomes a point where I feel that it's a necessary tool to convey what I'm talking about in this kind of other way. I want my body to be involved. I want my voice to be involved. I want to take the pieces from the second, second dimension to the third dimension to the fourth dimension. Yeah, yeah. one of, the, one of the, the way you put it in our original interview was sort of navigating that space between stagnation, revolution, and evolution. Evolution, yes. So I, I definitely think of my performance as evolution um, and I don't think evolution is ever comfortable. Can you say a little bit more about that? About evolution not being comfortable? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, evolution is change, right? Um, and change is coming out of a space 
change is changing, <laughs> right? You've been doing something the same way for so long, um, it's become comfortable, it's safe, right? Or mm -hmm. even if it's not safe, it feels, it's safe because you don't have to experience what else is happening. I mean, when I, if I, if I were to think about evolution, and I'm hoping that that's the case in this kind of current time, um, we have been doing things the same way for a very long time, right? Um, and, and a lot of those ways that, that these things have been done has just been wrong. And so in this quiet time, people have revolted, right? The question is, um, will that cause an evolution? Will something change, you know, in the long run, you know? Um, maybe more than tiny steps in a circle, right? So, mm -hmm. so that's, that's, that's kind of what that deals with. Great. I think that that is a good point um, for us to open things up to people's questions. Um, so you can either use the Zoom has a raise hands function. So you can like raise your hand in Zoom way and I can like call on you to um, ask your question. Right, so you can like unmute yourself and ask your question or um, you can just send a question in the chat and I can pass them along. Um, we already have one in in the Zoom group chat right now. Um, Tilly Strauss is asking, what are you going to do next? Um, in terms of my own work or in terms of events? I like how open-ended that question is. Take it whichever direction you like. <laughs> okay. So um, in terms of my own work, I'm going to take it. So right now I am continuing work on this body. So these are newer pieces that are developing slowly. I don't know, is that a decent shot? My head is in it, right? Yeah. Oh, that are developing slowly. Um, and then I got a kiln in my basement, so I am making work. That's a mess, so maybe I'll show show show. <laughs> um, so into that, um, I'm kind of focusing, and and these small frames, I want to go back to them because I have, I want to do an instant, I want to show them eventually. So I've been doing that work. Um, and I mean, this is the piece I'm working on right as we, not as we speak, but like five seconds ago. Um, so in terms of the body work, I'm going to keep working with this because it's very new for me. Um, keep working with this work and go larger. In terms of um, exhibitions, exhibitions and performances. Um, I'm in the intersectionality show that's travel to um, North Carolina, Charlotte. I just was there to install a piece. And um, I have a few other things coming up, some virtual. I have a show in Philly at the Clay Studio. Is that, I might be mixing up locations. There's a show in Philly and there's a show at the Clay Studios. Not mm -hmm. remembering the same place in different places. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's what I have coming up. Um, great. We have another question from somebody in the audience. So Judith Scott, you have your hand raised. You can take yourself yeah. off mute and ask the question on your own. Yes, I've known Aisha. It's been an honor for a long time from when she hey. was first in the two dimensional and broke out to the third, you know, dimension. It was so beautiful. And I'm wondering if you could show us one other piece from the Wasaic project. Would that be pro possible? So you could talk about it because I haven't been able to go and see any of the work. Okay. Is that possible for you to do? One of like the pieces they just showed on the website? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, I actually have those up on my screen. Um, okay. can you I can that? pull those up and then Aisha can talk about right. those in particular. We'll Whichever one, one Aisha way. would like to speak about. Yeah. Um, so let me share my screen really quickly. I, I once asked to choose some of her pieces and she said, she told me I was not a curator then. <laughs> I said, I like them all. So whichever. Yeah, beautiful. I, I'm wondering if it's frozen. Great. Oh, okay, here we go. So hopefully mm -hmm. everybody can um, see my screen now. 
Okay, so these are examples of the traps. Right. Um, so um, these are two different traps. One's a trap within a trap that's accompanying a, a performance to the trap song. Um, I, I, I utilize um, African print in the trap and then other fabrics that are both beautiful and gaudy at the same time, <laughs> that idea. And, and for me, that works with the idea of um, taste historically. Um, but it also, so I think, and so if you think about the trap, like you think about like uh, Pit My Car, I, I don't know if that show's still on, <laughs> um, <laughs> how decadent you can make it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes decadent is not, um, I guess, uh, does not, reveal uh, a certain level of class possibly without saying it you know like how some places are everything is beige um this goes in the opposite direction um, <laughs> but it's also beautiful um so it's inviting and it's clutch um so so and the idea is it, it is that people can get in them you can get in them they're huge um and it's interesting to see people interact with them. I've had people close the traps on themselves and it's like cozy. I do want to take them to another level where there's video components, but I haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like inside the trap, like you can close the trap, you know, right. so yeah. Thank you, they're beautiful. And there was one with three pieces, three ceramic figures. I can scroll down a little bit. Yeah, that, that's gorgeous, that one. This one, I'll pull it up. Yeah. Oh, the, the one with the, um. oh, okay, yes. Yeah. Thank you. There's two ceramic pieces in the trap in there. Um, and so this one is misery is a ride me. Misery and the idea of, um, there's this old story that my mom told me, and I actually think it has Eastern European roots um, of, of someone Picking up middle like a like a, a little person and then clapping on and not letting go, right? Um, <laughs> and and thinking about people carrying that which makes them sad, holding on to it, right? And and the possibility for burden to also be armor, you know, mm -hmm. defense. Um, so, you know. Miss both the both the main character and Misery. Misery is a child character, of holding the rope to the trap, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a question of control, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the perch is not is not is not actually feasible, but you know, mm -hmm. you get to be a little surreal every now and then. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. They're really really beautiful. I wish Thank you all the you. best. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Aisha, you mentioned something just now um, that the possibility of, um, you said, a burden to be armor. Can you say a little bit more about that phrase in particular? Um, okay, so if you think about, so, so literally, if you think about armor, it weighs a lot and it's just a pain, but it supposedly protects you, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I do think I do think that in those safe traps, there's a sense of being pr protected, you know? It's like um, not going outside of your cup. So I've worked, with, I've worked with students forever. And mm -hmm. so one of the fears of um, some, a few students have been moving out of their comfort zone, which could be their neighborhood, the high school environment, their school environment to this other place that is unfamiliar, that is unknown, that does not necessarily feel safe to them. And the truth is it is unknown and it is not necessarily safe, but it's, it moves outside of the box that they currently are in. And I don't think it just applies in one place. I think that applies to a lot of experiences. You know, I have not ever lived anywhere other than New York City. Um, I don't have any desire to live anywhere besides New York City. Um, 
but because uh, it's home and everybody's here, but also the idea of like moving and living someplace else away from everything that I know is uncomfortable to me. Right. Um, so we have a few more questions in the um, chat as well. One person is um, Rosie Gordon Walls is asking, as we look to the reset and speculate about the changes that will come from the field, what patterns of resistance will you bring us? Uh, what patterns of resistance? Um, so, I that's a difficult question to answer because I think my work is all about resistance, right? Um, it's 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 a con it's a it's, a, it's about the difference between resistance and complacency, right? Um, so in making the work, the idea of moving through the edges, the boundaries is key. Um, and in, in making my own work, I mean, right now I'm using a lot of patterns, but I feel like the, my pattern is so broad that it takes a while to repeat itself. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, so, and, and what I'm trying to do is to put it all together, you know, um, and hopefully it will trigger something in someone else. Because I don't know that I feel like, I mean, I feel like being an artist and making work um, and, and talking about things that are, are not, um, necessarily comfortable um is resistance in its, in and of itself mm -hmm. but it it's not the um it's not a march on the street right um and i don't want to make that a performance you know um that has to be as sincere as humanly possible mm -hmm. um and and not to say that the work or the performance is not sincere but it is in a different category in and of itself it's rather a narrative of uh, a manifestation metaphorically of rather than the actual act. Um, and I think the manifestations are necessary, but I don't want to confuse the two. So, so Aisha, um, I have to ask you because I think that, first of all, I've worked with you for a long time. And I think that um, you're very polite in talking about the edges because you have always um brought a kind of um uh excitement and normalizing of things that are complex to your work um so i see your work as a point of resistance i was just trying to, to push you a little bit more to see if in another space and another time when you're not cautious because we have to be cautious our bodies are points of resistance right right um if there if, if if there was one body of work that you would push more i mean your clay work is absolutely beautiful and needs to be bought and collected by those of us that recognize that um i say that first of all and secondarily your performance work whether it was 10 years ago 15 years ago um to now it is bold and, br and braggadocious and, a, part, and a, a state of resistance so pushing forward with, with in the reset we don't know what the hell is going to happen right in the reset what what do how do you see that this work will be pushed are you going to do more ceramics you're going to use more performance is there a part of this complex brain of yours i mean you're so brilliant i say it openly that you, okay. that you want to push that you haven't yet pushed and that's kind of where i want to go with that question um so i want to do more video if, and but that's not in result as a well it is in that i've had more time right of quietness that's going to be gone in a second because the semester is starting up and i think my kids are going to be home do a school again but um <laughs> um so i want to do more video because because one of the things i've been concerned with um in the past three years is um bringing all of my forms of art making together so that the mediums because i think from the outside point of view i'm like 
you know, oh, you are a jack of all trades. You like paint, sculpt, draw, perform, <laughs> you know, make poetry, make music, like a whole bunch of different things. Um, and I'm, I'm the masters of, master of none, but I think the development of each element going into one object thing moment um, allows for a kind of mastering. It would be a thing, something nobody else is doing <laughs> or has done or is, wants to do. But um, I think video allows me to do that. It's just my patience, because I, I, I also have issues with letting anybody else do any part of the work. Um, so sitting down and editing, and that's, that's, that's really it, the editing um, for me is, is the issue, but that's what I'm interested in doing. I've been thinking a lot about. This is actually feels, Aisha, like an interesting opportunity to talk about um, like how you conceive of taking a new direction in your practice. So like we've been talking about all the things that you have done in your practice, but um, like how have you been thinking about approaching video or like engaging with a new medium like that? Well, no, so, so, so for me, video is not a new medium. Okay. And so it wouldn't be, I just haven't been in a little while. Okay. Um, and so, um, so there's a few things that I want to do with it. Um, so I want to do, I want, I definitely have uh, footage already that needs to be edited, several footage, feet, several feet of footage that needs to be edited. But I want to do some projection-based work over the ceramic sculptures and the drawings. So I'm um, and some animation-related things, which is a whole other thing that takes a lot of time to get into. Um, I do have a solo coming up at, at Wellencore Gallery in the fall, um, and I'm not sure that the video is going to happen, but I'm, I'm, it's my goal that there will be some animated related video for that exhibition. Uh, I'll also, yeah, there'll be some things coming together for that exhibition, so I'm working on that. Your sound went out? Oh, hello. Hi, okay. sorry. Um, <laughs> I said, great. Um, so we have a <laughs> request in the chat for you to read the chat because there are um, very many oh, nice chat. messages praising your work in there. Okay, um, I'm going to, oh, oh, there's a lot of chat things. Okay. There okay. are. Um, All right, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to talk. Hi, Aisha, hi, Michelle. <laughs> hi, Rosie. Uh, hi, Nafisa. Hi, Marie. Hi, the travel thinking, the code switch is necessary. Self-awareness is key. Yes, Joshua. Self-awareness is key. Um, tonal switches. Hi, Marie. I, I think I said that again. Um, have but don't necessarily want to feed the people. Um, using all the tools you have to get the message across. What are you going to do next? Um, Thanks. Wow. Yes, I'm very excited about the Kim. Okay, I saw Rosie. Um, thank you. <laughs> Jessica wants to be trapped in one of my boxes. What would make you ever want to leave? I mean, that's a good question. I think that people are afraid to leave because they've made those traps very comfortable. They've been getting used to them. I mean, I, I think your question is literal, literal, but metaphorically, it applies. Michelle, Aisha, having the opportunity to witness your work, create work. Get, oh, you make us go beyond. Okay, not a question, but thank you. Um, thank you, Marie. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Um, oh, chat. Okay. I also will save the chat for later so you can have that as like uh, an object from Thank this you. meeting. But um, can you, you were just talking about like um, that question of um, what would make you want to leave the trap when you're approaching both literally and metaphorically. Can you talk about um, that as it relates to when you've actually had people sit in the traps. So you 
we were talking about that a little bit earlier, how sometimes people will like fit in the traps and because they're so comfortable, they'll like close themselves in them. So like, what have those conversations with people looked like when people have actually gone in the traps and said like, I don't know if I want to come out. Okay, so, so, to, so, I'm always trying to find the balance between making something beautiful, um, but it also has darker, um, a darker narrative, right? So the, so one of the things I think that's a little complicated about my work is there's always multiple stories, right? Um, so the traps are beautiful. They're fun. They're colorful. Kids love, people love boxes. They love to get into them. They're seductive. They're supposed to be, right? So the, the interaction of people getting in there and feeling safe and warm kind of has a, a slightly different narrative, right? Um, and, and everyone's interaction with it, because I've had people who, no, I'm not going there. I'm not closing it. Or people who are like, I'm not, I'm not okay with it being closed. And then people who are very comfortable and feel safe and like it, and it's a fun game, right? Um, as a parent, I know one of the, my kids' favorite things to play with when they were younger. I didn't set up my work anywhere near them. Um, and the one time I did, I, there was some yelling that had to be had because you cannot get into my artwork. <laughs> Uh, while I'm building it, um, was the box that came with the game. So there is a certain kind of, um, there's always a little, some level of play, some tongue in cheek, some something that also entices our playfulness in the work. And for some, for some, um, I think it, that's the part that takes over. You know, I mean, I think one of the things that's beautiful about art, um, the most beautiful thing about art are the people viewing it, right? Because uh, no one sees it the same, right? Um, and so I think that people looking at the work and how they read and how they relate to it, you know, it can be completely different from what my intentions are, you know? And it's not that my intentions are to scare you with a trap. It's to play on that edge, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for answering that. Um, we have another question from Joseph Anino. If you unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi. So, yeah, I'm the one that says uh, what would make you want to leave. So, um, thank you for uh, talking about that a bit. And I was, uh, you know, I didn't mean it at both levels, right? Literally, what would make me want to leave, but also um, the, the metaphors that you're exploring and this idea of these very comfortable, beautiful traps. But I'm wondering if you thought much about kind of what's inside there or even how the experience might change once we're trapped in. You talked a bit about maybe putting a camera in there or something or some of the work you're doing with video. Have you really thought about... Um, you know, what's that experience once the box closes? Um, how might that change? And how does that kind of relate between, it's a very private experience, one person, maybe two people are having this small space versus all the people outside of it that are in the gallery being excluded from that experience or having to wait for that experience. So I'm just curious if you thought about that or um, there's anything in the work currently that addresses that? Um, I mean, I think, so being inside the space, I know, um, uh, being as, uh, so I have a, a, a friend who's an artist, Glenda Lee Medina, and she did a piece, she built a box, and when you would go inside her work, she would, um, tell you, read a poem to you, not read, recite a poem to you. So, so that level of um, and I, I, she just showed that piece recently, well, before we were all locked up. <laughs> but um, she showed that her piece, I want to say, um, fall, in the fall. Um, I might get all the dates wrong. I don't think it was that cold, so fall. Um, and th so there's this thing about intimacy, right? That um, 
especially the intimacy the track creates in a room that is full, right? And the process of having to take turns to get to that space of intimacy, you know? Um, and, and it works for some, it doesn't work for others. Um, when putting a video in it, I was thinking, in thinking about putting a video in the trap, um, I was specifically thinking about intimacy, you know? Um, uh, and, and in several different ways, ways, something else is in the trap, because people always say, there's no bait in your trap. What's the bait? And for me, the bait is always the trap. That's why I make them pretty, right? But a video also would act as the bait, you know? And so there are things I haven't worked out in that, like, what do I want to show in that video? There's a certain kind of thing I do with my practice where, especially my performance, it is key to me to make the performance appear to not have any relationship, there's always narrative, to the narrative. That, that's vo the vocal words that are coming out of my mouth. Um, and then, so because what that does is that creates a space for the viewer to fill, right? Because we, as, as people, always try to find connections. So the, the, the less the words relate to the, to the image, the more the viewer works to make a connection to two. Why is this happening together? You know, and I'm interested in that kind of uh, that exercise that people do. And I don't need to, and I mean, I don't need to know what your, the conclusions the, the, the viewer comes to, but I'm always interested when people have told me, you know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that was great, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, we are nearing 6 p.m. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Oh, I see one more in um, the chat. So Deirdre Harris Kelly is asking, um, saying, can't get away from the link between the traps and quarantine. How might these experiences move people to imagine new worlds and to break out of their constrictions? Which feels very related to what you were talking about earlier about sort of like the role of the artist in, um, you know, a mode of resistance. So yeah, can you, can you speak to Deirdre's question? That is, a, hi Deirdre, that's a great question um, that I didn't even think about. <laughs> How can the traps, huh, you know, that's, that's also a hard one because I also think about what I've been doing to my traps because I'm home all the time, which has been cleaning it and decorating and, and baking. Um, but I think um, perhaps they, mm, I think the home as a trap right now, because that's what it kind of is, and also simultaneously being a place that's safe reflects what I'm doing, not reflects, my traps reflect that. They, you know, they feel warm, they feel safe, they feel cozy, right? And we're all trapped in our homes. It's an interesting kind of way to play with words um, or in reality, not really play, but you know, actually be. Um, I, I feel like I have to think, think about that. I just feel like my traps become um, a little bit of a, a, a narrative of what's happening, you know, um, and how do we get out of that? I, right now, we have no way out until we figure out how to deal with the, with this, this why we're quarantined. Um, but what we can think about is how do we make the space we are in more beautiful and I don't just mean the home we're in the mental space the space we are as a society how do we make the trap that we live in because we live in our bodies if you think of the body as a trap how do we make the societies and the communities more beautiful which is kind of like a, a, an inside out turning up of my thought my initial thoughts with my work but it applies I think does that answer your question I don't know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, good to see you. Um, okay, it is 5.58. Does anybody else, if you raise your hand, we can ask like maybe one or two more questions, but then I want to be respectful of Aisha's time and let people go on with their Fridays. Um, 
there are no other questions, um, I will um, just say thank you, Aisha, for taking the time to talk about your work. This is, um, you know, I said this at the beginning of the call, I'm really, really glad that uh, you were the first person that we had scheduled for our future artist talk series because I, I knew that this would go well um, and I think it did. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.